Uh, yeah. uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So, uh, uh, this time thought is a uh, uh, in uh, forum number two. So, the, uh, I will be a uh, session chair uh, for this uh, time slot. So, uh, we have two speakers uh, for this uh, session. So, the uh, first speaker, Nina from Kentik. Yes. Thank you. So the uh, title is embedded uh, CDNs in 2023. Thank you very much. And hello, I'm very happy to be here. This is my first Apricot. So uh, very excited I also get to talk. So today I'm going to talk about embedded CDNs in 2023. And why does that come up now? Well, for me personally, it comes up because I realized late last year, that it was 10 years ago that I had a panel at Nanoc where we were talking about embedded CDNs. And back then we had Google, we had Akamai and Netflix was just coming up. And we were facing sort of like, oh, these are really difficult. These are different. They're doing things in a different way. The hardware, different sizes. And we were trying to sort of debate and talk about that. And then my thought, my idea was, hey, what's happening now? If I'm not no longer running or working at an ISP. So this is based on research and the data I've had available and help from friends. So first, let's just get the definition of a CDN in place. So we can talk about that as a collection of servers, caches, call them whatever you want. Uh, that are distributed over a geographically distributed area. Um, and then on top of that, we have a method to place content on servers, basically pull or push. Some are pulling the, the content out based on demand. Some are pushing content out um, in ways that we will talk about a little bit later. And then the last part is a method to make sure that the end user is going to the cache that is most suitable for that particular user. And we're gonna talk about that uh, later as well. And when I say embedded, what is it that we mean about that? Well, embedded is when the CDN provides servers to put inside an ISP's network, not just on the edge, but for the ISP to decide where in my network do I wanna put that, and most of the time, these servers will also have IP addresses from the ISP and basically appear on the internet as being part or originated in that ASN. Um, another thing that I'll talk about a little bit later that we should be aware of is that the servers can be clustered together. So you will have a number of different hardware devices but logically it will appear as one because they will be sharing their disk space. It's a way for the CDN to scale the amount of storage they will have at a location. But clustering can also have, oh, sorry. Oh. Clustering can also, you should be aware, also happen over servers that are distributed geographically. So don't always assume that just because some servers are in one pop and you have a set of servers in another pop, they are two different clusters that can be the same or they can be three or four clusters. So again, a lot of things to be aware of. But first, let's talk about what has happened in the CDN market over the past decade. So CDNs really became important and an important part of our, our ecosystem as volume of data rise. So we were talking about entertainment. There's a high demand of, it was started out as pictures, but then soon turned into movies and, and, and videos. And that has really increased the demand of high volume download close to the end users. And in the beginning, we had Akamai, Lumen, Tata, Edge of the call today, and they are still here, and we know them as good, reliable uh, CDNs. And over the years, we have seen some new major players like Cloudflare, FastPath, Fastly, and StackPath, and they are offering not just the 
distribution of high volume content, but more specialized services like security, DDoS uh, protection, and high performance. And we have to mention that the longtime players like Akamai have also expanded their services into this area. Large content producers like software companies, um, video, social networks, often use a lot of different CDNs depending on the kind of content they want to deliver, the kind of service. Some services are using one CDN to be delivered, others another one. Others are focused on the geographically uh, footprint of the individual CDNs as a choice. And finally, multi-vendor strategy often works also for content. Another thing we've seen uh, giant content producers do, and they did that already 10 years ago, is to build their own dedicated CDN. Google started out with uh, what is today Google, used to be uh, Google Global Cash um, for YouTube. And then Netflix followed. Um, and we have seen Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple. If you have enough content, it might make sense for you to build your own specialized uh, CDN to make sure it's optimized for your content. Um, another interesting thing we've seen is that the big cloud providers have a CDN to front them. And the big CDNs are slowly also introducing cloud services. So maybe we're seeing the full market go converging into what's basically the same type of services, but with each individual strengths or focus or starting point. Um, yeah, another difference that I didn't put on the slide is that some have been very centralized. We will have our own pops. We will have a few central pops and then serve the content from there, connect them with a the backbone. Or we can be very, very distributed and have little islands and a lot of servers all over the world. And also in this perspective, we're seeing a convergence where the ones that started out being very, very distributed are building backbones between their pops. And those who turned out who started out being sort of centralized are diverting themselves more and more and deeper, deeper into um, out in the regions and into people's networks and creating an embedded uh, solution. So who, was, who are offering uh, embedded servers now? So what I've could figure out is that the players on this slide are the ones where in the data set I have available, I have seen people configure as embedded servers. Um, we recognize some good names, uh, Akamai, Netflix, the ones have been around for a long time, and also the newer ones as Cloudflare, Amazon, Apple, um, and I'm sure that more and more will do that. Um, and let's have, have a little bit more statistics. And a short word on the data set that I have uh, available. <clears throat> it is basically a sample of the internet, some NetFlow data that I have access to. It is biased among the Americans, uh, the Americas, so North and South America. So this is not a global snapshot, but maybe a snapshot of that part of the world. And what I've done here is I've tried to count and see um, when you look at a CDN, how many ISPs in my data set uh, do have this, uh, an embedded server, at least one embedded server from this CDN? And I see with that count that way, the top six is that Google and Netflix and Facebook, Google and Netflix are equally sized. They're in like uh, a quarter of the amount of ISPs that I've been looking at. And then Akamai, um, Facebook, sort of in the next tier level. And then we have uh, small percentages again. But again, this is a regional snapshot of the Americas. It can look very different elsewhere. Another way to look at it is if we look at the traffic, again, this is NetFlow data from a sample of, of ISPs uh, that I've been able to look at. If I look at the traffic marked as CDN traffic, 
um, we're seeing that 74% there is coming over an external network border into this particular ISP. 14% is coming from embedded servers. 7% is coming internally um, between embedded servers inside the network. And 5% is um, coming from outside of the network into the servers. So again, this is aggregated over a number of ISPs, uh, but it is interesting to see um, that there is a relatively large amount of traffic from embedded servers, because this counts ISPs who have embedded and those who have chosen to not to, and including carrier traffic, uh, carrier um, ISPs. If we dive into the traffic and dive into the large, largest four, uh, embedded CDNs. I tried to look at how much of the traffic into the sample of the ISPs who have embedded servers from this particular CDN. And here I'm trying to see <clears throat> how much of the traffic is coming from the embedded servers, from outside of the network to the embedded servers, and then how much is going into the server themselves, and then finally embedded to embedded. And we see the red is what is going from content from the embedded servers to the end users. And maybe you would expect this to be a lot bigger, uh, that when you have embedded servers, almost all of the traffic should go from them to the end users. But there's a number of factors that means that not all of that traffic will do that including that maybe your setup is not very efficient, you do not have enough capacity. So this is not what an optimal deployment would look like for this individual CDNs, but it is what the reality is looking like for the ISPs that I have been looking at in this um, uh, for this purpose. So the things that factor into how efficient the setup will be is how do the end user get to the closest server? And I've been trying to dig into, are they doing it the same way? Are they doing it very differently? And I think the majority of the, the, the CDNs have sort of the same way of directing the customer or the end user to the server. But again, it varies individually from one to one. And there's a lot of factors we need to be aware of when we if you're an ISP, consider if you want to do this or not. <clears throat> so here's an overview of the different ways that um, is offered. BGP, almost all of the CDNs will have requirement of a BGP session between a cluster or a server, or maybe this the ISP. And that is used to signal from the ISP to the CDN. These are the end users that should be served by, uh, by the embedded servers. And sometimes the CDN will give you a mean to influence which end users are being served from which cluster or which server. And you can do that by uh, the prefixes that are being announced. And sometimes they will even listen to PGP parameters like MED or um, um, met, uh, yeah, and then the, the usual longest prefix uh, steering and um, and that kind of thing. Um, some offer that you do this, but most of the time you can always always uh, in, announce all of your prefixes, and then they will have other means to make sure uh, that the end user is coming to the closest server. Many CDNs are also using the DNS server that the end user is re using to request the content. And <clears throat> what they do is that they take the individual name servers in the ISPs and map that into each of the clusters uh, that it belongs to. So the end users are basically mapped to a cluster based on the DNS server that they're using to request content. Um, 
number of ISPs are using Anycast, so they're having the same IP address or the same IP addresses for the content announced by the servers to the ISP. And that way, making sure that the routing inside the ISP is, is bringing the end user to the closest uh, cache. And finally, almost always, there's some sort of fallback to the geolocation of IP addresses. We all know how reliable that be, but it's actually been more and more reliable uh, over the years is my experience. Maybe because the content uh, providers or the content CDNs are doing the geolocation mapping themselves or because um, they are demanding the uh, geolocation providers to be more precise because it affects their um, uh, the reliability of their services. So <clears throat> if we look at the use case where BGP is used both for the steering and the signaling between the ISP, we just have a quick um, overview of how those CDNs who do that work. So here, imagine you have um, XYZ.24 uh, announced to A and XYW is announced to cluster B. And you have a user from XYW123 and they're requesting a movie or a file. And they're asking the CDN, hey, give me this file. And the CDN goes, uh, replies back based on the announcement into the servers and the mapping they've done internally based on that is, hey, well, you should go to B and um, the end user client will go to B and say, hey, give me movie and the movie download will start. <clears throat> so this way of um, of mapping end users to, to the individual clusters work really, really well for people who have a well-structured address plan. Well, it can work well if you have one cluster in your network, depending on how you do it. But if you want to distribute your servers further into your network, this is the thing to be aware of uh, if you're able to support this kind of, of end user mapping. If we move on to a quick reminder on how the DNS-based version of a CDN works, is again, the end user is asking, hey, I'd like to go to site.com. Um, and the local DNS server asks the authority of the DNS server, sort of like, hey, I'd like to go to site.com. And it turns out site.com is mapped into site.cdn.something.com. And then the CDN have been is telling uh, the DNS, basically redirected to the CDN DNS and say, hey, where is site.com.cdn.something.com? And it's sort of like, go to address A and get your file. Very quick overview. So, yeah. But again, how does the CDN map? What is the, what is the decision-making uh, that site.com is to A, go to A for this end user? And I said before, it's based on the DNS servers, but there is a lot of more magic that is being um, used in the, um, in the back end of the CDNs. So let's have a look at some of that ma magic. Some of the, the CDNs are often measuring the internet without we knowing or thinking about it, but they can do that in different ways. Some are using their client, some are using uh, their clusters, some are using central servers somewhere that they're measuring out to different locations, typically to different DNS servers and determining what's the latency, what is the best path there. And also look up internally and say, hey, the route there does it go over a link that I like to use or does it go over a link that I'm less keen to use? So the quality has to be really significantly better for me to use this path. Um, and that way they build up an internal map of the best, uh, the best way from this DNS server to a cluster. And this, this is the signaling and the data that goes into the response going, hey, where is site.com for this particular user? Um, 
Another thing they all keep track of is the load of the servers. So again, we were looking at location, DNS server that is being used, load of the individual servers to make sure that they go to one that has room for the app to serve that end user. And finally, you cannot always count on that all the content that is being served by a certain CDN is going to be on all the servers in the uh, that is part of that CDN. Some content goes to only specific locations based on the content customer's choices, or sometimes uh, it goes there based on what the CDN is determining that, well, not that many people are gonna use this file anyway, so I don't wanna push it out. I only wanna push out the, the files that are popular that I know will it will benefit from going over there. So almost all CDNs or embedded CDNs will have a long tail of traffic coming over the edge so not 100% of the traffic will go to um, from the embedded servers. So let's have a look at what the kind of traffic profiles you can expect from some of these uh, players. I don't have traffic profiles for all of them, uh, but here are a couple of examples. And I've chosen examples from different ways of um, distributing the content out to the uh, to the servers. So here, if we're looking at a typical Netflix embedded server or embedded ISP uh, traffic profile, where what Netflix does is that they're centralized calculating every day, these are the files that we wanna push out. These are the ones we expect that people will watch. And they're sending that content out to the users in a fill window. Um, so this is where the fill window that takes place in this, where you see the small spikes on the graph. The large blue spike is for this uh, well-dimensioned uh, installation is the traffic going from the embedded servers to the end users in the peak hour. And you'll see the green one is the long tail, which is in spite of it being a very well dimensioned um, uh, installation, it has a small long tail going over the network edge to the end users. And notice there are two spikes here as well for the fill traffic. The small one is the traffic going from outside of the network to the servers inside the network. And then the yellow one is going from servers inside the network to the other servers. Because what they do is that they wanna push the content into the network as few times as possible, and then have the servers inside the network distribute uh, the content among themselves. So for this ISP, they have managed to sort of minimize the amount of traffic going over the edge and maximize uh, the traffic going internally in the network. And hopefully that was what they were planning to do. If we take a look at a typical and very good Akamai installation here, again, the way Akamai is distributing the content is a poll uh, method. So it's based on demand, an end user is asking for content. And then the content is downloaded to the servers and then to the end user. Um, so we see here, the blue again is from the servers to the end user. And then we have the green spike here, which is the content going from outside of the network to the servers. So again, based on demand, the high demand for content is at the same time. So that means that the demand of traffic going to the server spikes at the same time as the end user traffic. And then here we have the, the yellow one is sort of a more constant um, traffic going directly to the end users from outside of the network. And in this installation, they do not have any content going between the servers, which is makes sense because an Akamai cache will ask up to um, outside of the network for new content and not uh, somebody to another cache inside of the network. 
Another pull request um, uh, installation here is a typical Facebook installation, where again we see high uh, blue spikes. And then we see that the peak of the uh, traffic going to the servers, again, the pool, and the traffic coming from outside the network always um, is peaking at the same time. And one of the reasons for this is that Facebook has specific content that will never go to any embedded servers uh, because it needs to be globally consistent. So they will always make sure that that comes more uh, from outside of the network because caching it locally doesn't make any sense. Another thing that the uh, BGP feed or sometimes even uh, mail me EP, IP addresses, please, is a way to limit the amount of users that can use the embedded servers. So why would you wanna do that? Well, the idea of an embedded server is that the ISP get a server for their customers, which means that the ISP here has a way of determining who is allowed to be served uh, from my caches or from my servers. Um, because they might not be interested in providing server, uh, traffic to their peers. Their peers might not actually want to have the traffic either. Uh, so the IP addresses that are announced using BGP typically is also used to build um, access control list on the servers to sort of say, well, these are the users that are allowed to be um, served from here. This means that when the ISP is building both their BGP feeds to the servers or to the, uh, to the CDN, um, they must make sure that they're consistent in, um, in announcing the same uh, IP space to the, all the servers in the same cluster uh, to make sure that um, there's consistency between who is allowed to use them and who is um, uh, who is meant to use it and the content that is being placed on the different servers. All right. So why do I care so much about, or why do I focus so much about the consistency between what is announced, the ability to announce the address plan? Well, it is because these are the things you have to think about when you decide how to embed or how to deploy your embedded servers in your network. Because if you're having the dream of saving not only the bandwidth on your edge, but also the bandwidth on your backbone internally in your network, you need to make sure that the topology, the way you have built your network, the way your DNS servers are, are distributed on your network, or the way that your IP address plan is maybe aggregated locally or maybe not aggregated locally, all of that affects the way that the traffic will flow um, to or between your embedded servers. Say, for example, if you wanted to distribute into two different regions, and if you have your DNS and you, it's a CDN that is using the DNS servers to map the end users, well, that requires that the two regions are using two different DNS servers uh, for the end user or the end users in the two regions are using two different DNS servers. If they're using the same and you're not doing anything else, it doesn't really matter that you have put two different clusters out there in two different regions because traffic will go between the regions anyways, because the users are mapped to the same, uh, the two clusters have the same uh, user group mapped to them. So these are the things you have to go and investigate on each of the individual CDNs that you wanna do like a distributed deployment on. All right. And I'm getting closer to the end. But there was one thing that we did talk about very much back in 2012, and that was the hardware. It was like, how much power? How big is it? What are the line cards we can use? And what I've seen happen over the past decade is that the hardware has basically been rapidly deployed or rapidly developed. That what was a 4U server for 10 years ago now is a 1U server. 
and what you could have a 10 gig port and serve maybe eight gigs of traffic can now maybe serve 175 gigs out of a, a, a bundled 100 gig port, two bundled 100 gig ports. And whatever choice of power you want is what you can get. So I think on the hardware side, it's not really that interesting anymore. Once you decide this is what I'm gonna do, you can find the power that suits you and you can have small uh, devices and you're not going to have rack by rack by rack by rack to make sure that you get uh, the amount of traffic out that you need. Also the installation processes, I think have improved quite, quite a lot. I remember having um, a CDN deployed that needed like two racks and a number of servers. And it turned out that the, the um, technician needed hundred hours to install and install the servers. Each individual server need to have to type an IP address into, the, into an interface. And uh, it was like, whoa, that's a lot of time. And this has been worked very hard from the CDN side to make smoother processes, even though some of them still require the CDN, uh, the ISP to do uh, handle some part of the um, logical installation as well. But good job there, I think, on, uh, on what's been doing. So conclusion, is it harder? I don't know. I think it's probably the same. Uh, but maybe the diff the focus is differently. It's less about processes. It's less about um, less about um, you know can I get what I want. But it's more about understanding exactly what it is you want to have out of uh, gain from embedded servers, and it's about understanding what the individual CDNs are doing. But we also have to step take a step back. A lot of them, if you do the default setting, will give you a really good experience and a lot of saving on your network edge. It's only when you wanna go and save on your network, on your internal backbone as well, you have to really dig into the details about how the individual CDN is working. And I have time for questions because I was a little bit too fast. Questions? Comments, because I would actually also like to know from the ISPs in this uh, room, what do you experience? We working? Yes. Okay, I have a question uh, from the chat from Mariella Esquera. She asks, how is security secured in embedded CDNs? That's a good question. Um, from my experience, it is the boxes that you get into your network is what you would call, some providers are calling hardened boxes. So they do have uh, extensive um, security themselves, but also you have, so some kind of firewall, again, the ACLs, the information that you give them about which IP addresses are allowed to contact this box, I think is a big part of that security uh, and is making sure that these are the only ones who are uh, allowed to get in. Um, other areas of security I know is uh, I have seen people with secured racks where if you get a specific kind of servers uh, from certain CDNs, they also have requirements to the physical installations of the servers in order to agree to have them in your network. But most of the time it is handled with software on the boxes uh, to prevent anybody to uh, get in there. And then when you think about it, what can anybody do on a hash, which has a lot of bandwidth and is serving large volumes of data, 
uh, already and is meant to do that. Can we do anything particularly bad from that? I don't know. Any other questions or experiences? Also, I do take corrections from the CDN players in the room. Uh, if there is no one, uh, I have a comment. As, uh, right. Yeah, uh, com 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 comment is okay. Uh, so, okay. Uh, yeah. If my memory uh, is correct, uh, the uh, more than ten or around ten years ago, the uh, uh, Akamai uh, AACP uh, was the first player uh, distribute uh, local cache server uh, this, uh, embedded uh, CDN servers uh, in the ISP network. So, and uh, according to the uh, your uh, slides, the, uh, uh, not only uh, Akamai, so uh, Facebook, uh, Google, uh, and uh, Apple, so they have uh, embedded server uh, like Akamai. So, uh, the embedded server is very mm, helpful, uh, not only for ISP, so, uh, but also IEX. So, uh, if uh, do you have uh, any information about the uh, embedded CDN servers deployed in uh, IEX? Uh, so, would you share the information here? Okay, yeah. So, I had I didn't look into uh, embedding into IXPs because usually, in my experience, uh, that would be considered a pop uh, from the CDN's uh, perspective because so that would still be part of their network and part of their ASN. I know that there are some who have embedded into like IXPs ASN. Uh, but I, I didn't include those in uh, in this investigation. But I know it, it's a solution, but I think the preferred way uh, to do that is, is to build a POP that might have some sort of agreement of to be embedded or to be at the IX as a part of the IX offering. Uh, but internally in the CDN, it's just another POP uh, and not an embedded solution. So a pop with their own uh, ASN, so they are able to to peer with, uh, with the participants on the IX. Matt? Please now. Okay. Yeah, uh, to, to go to that, I mean, I can only speak uh, for my own company uh, at Meta. We, we do do that which is a mix of what Nina was just describing. Um, so the, the caches we do deploy on an IAX, they have their own AS, they're not the same AS as a, as a pop, um, and they will will peer on, on the IAX with the members and, and can serve cacheable content there, uh, while a pop would also serve um, dynamic content, which, which is not cacheable. So where we have a pop, we would obviously always connect to uh, the IX with the pop because that is the better solution. But we do deploy uh, caches on IXs in locations where we do not have a pop. So as an example, we have caches, uh, both PH open IX here, as well as, as get fix. Soon we will have a pop here, then we will probably dismantle them and connect those directly to the pop, which, which gives the IX members more because they also get the dynamic content, but uh, we do have the solution. And I know other CDNs do as well. All right. Thank you. Any other? Yeah. My microphone. Uh, yeah, as uh, time is up. So the, uh, thank you for great presentations. So oh, and the, uh, let's give a good hand to Nina. And next speaker is here, uh, Achi, please go on the stage. Uh, yeah, so uh, Achi from uh, PHNOG. 
uh, title is PH Internet Landscape. Thank you. Uh, I'll be wearing a different hat uh, this time. This is more to give you a holistic view of the Philippines. So generally the information uh, we have is available publicly, but it's, it is presented this way to give you uh, consolidated info in, in this, the following slides. Okay. A bit of a disclaimer. So I'm representing multiple hats. So for this time, it's gonna be uh, me, uh, perspectives and insights and learnings uh, being exposed to the community in the global internet. Okay, Philippines in numbers. So Philippines is an archipelago. It's composed of three major island groups, that is Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And we have 7,641 islands uh, on high tide. On low tide, uh, we can't count yet because if you look outside, they're building more islands. So probably we'll do that next time. In terms of population, in population, only 2,000 of those islands uh, have people. So there are a lot more islands to explore. We currently have about 113 million in population and the capital is Manila where we are now. For infrastructure, we have 10 uh, subsea uh, cable systems coming in around 670 ASNs, 10 local IXPs, 9 CLS, where those cables land, and 14 data centers to date. Okay, This is a visual representation of the current infrastructure. So we positioned it this way so it, it can be easier seen. On the left side and right side, you can see the different positions of the DCs where the cable lands. Uh, if you notice, Majority of the infrastructure is on the Luzon Island, which was a big deal during that time in case something happens to the Philippines, we will be totally disconnected, which actually happens a couple of times. That's why we were actually out of the internet. So the original design was to have redundancy. And the first item that was done was to provide, oh, sorry. Yeah. First thing we did was to provide redundancy on the northern part. So on the higher part, uh, we have their TGNIA, which was earlier uh, provided in 2009, and then redund other redundancies came in. So the big issue was all the protection for subsea was on the major island, which is Luzon. So what happens if Luzon goes down? The second redundancy came down south in Mindanao, where we currently have a uh, growing a number of subsea cables and uh, cables say stations. The area for future growth is now in Visayas, which is a work in progress, but uh, I, I can only provide public information right now so I can disclose other secret stuff. One thing to highlight here is actually uh, a lot of initiatives were done during the pandemic or post-pandemic time, which actually highlighted 10 of the current 19 subsea cables started by 2020, and nine out of 10 of those cables was during post-pandemic. So uh, most of us during pandemic probably were busy doing something else here. A lot of opportunities came in, which actually helped the Philippines in terms of redundancy. Now a view of the ISP play, this is more of a uh, base on B4 space. Uh, if you know this here, it's predominantly uh, managed by two big players, that is PLDT and Globe, and they actually manage a lot of smaller players, which are subsets of their infrastructure. But on the right side, there's a new players coming in. Uh, Rages is one of them, which is, a, which is a power utility company, and probably they realize that they have this whole fiber backbone across the Philippines, and why not maximize that? Wi-Fi City has also started doing fiber as well as PTNT. Dito is also the third player, which is serving a mobile service. And giving you a brief background on the ISP play. So historically, it was uh, perceived that only ISPs or service providers or big telcos that can provide those services. But here we have a lot of players, actually. So on the first part, the telco ISPs, given they, they provide both mobile and uh, other services, then ISPs, basic internet services. Then we have the cable TVs. 
a lot of the movement in terms of ASNs came from uh, cable TVs, which historically just provided uh, cable service. And then they are now ISPs in those specific areas. Enterprise also plays uh, a role in this one because they manage their own infrastructure as well as academes, which have different uh, branches across the Philippines where they normally home it to one uh, big campus and it's aggregated from there. The government network also managed their own. Uh, currently, it's under Prejunet. So most of the traffic from government goes to Prejunet, which is actually hosted in Manila, but they have different branch offices outside. And then lastly, the Pop Telco. So Philippines is an archipelago. We have a lot of islands you can consider on the edges. So the Pop Telco actually plays an important role because they provide connectivity on the edges. So the idea here is for collaboration and the different players to get their connectivity across. And one thing to highlight is in one session last time back in uh, APTIC in Singapore, so I was asked, how was the fiber penetration in Philippines? So I told them uh, the question might be inappropriate. It's the question is being connected. So we actually use different ways uh, possible to get us connected, whether fiber, wired, wireless, copper, coax. So the, the important thing is we get interconnected. A view of the ASNs. Uh, we also see a very huge jump in, in, in the number. So based on this slide, uh, the highest we got was way back 2016. But for some reason, during pandemic time in 2021, there were a lot of uh, ASN application. It's based on what we uh, observe, it is driven by the need to peer. The concept of peering here initially was, oh, there's a problem with connectivity. Everything is slow. Okay, let's peer. Okay, how can you peer? You don't have these resources at hand. So from a community perspective, the NOG did a very huge play in terms of educating the local community. And this is more or less what happened. It's now a steady, steady growth in terms of uh, ISPs getting their own infrastructure so they can peer. Probably this is also the reason why a lot of players wanted to set up their own IX, which is, can be a different discussion. The idea when we did the Cascano ISP is for everyone to connect to the ISP, not to build their own. In terms of uh, V6, probably you can say we are a bit late, but we are seeing the trend as well. Uh, we're showing uh, adoption in terms of V6 uh, addresses and the decline in V4 as well. It's it's a uh, fun thing to know. Like one time when we did V6 cascades. Uh, we started to get lower requests in terms of additional IPv4 addresses. So we were expecting that they will be deployed v6, but what actually happened is just they just became better in managing their existing resource. So digging deeper to that one, we found out that there were a lot of legacy devices uh, that is being managed in their own systems, especially on the billing system. If they can't build their customers, if they're on the traditional setup using V4, then they have no reason to go to V6. Right now, it's still a work in progress, so we'll probably monitor this and provide other inputs uh, to help the community. For the IX and the DCs, uh, it is also presented here similar to the slide earlier. Uh, we have uh, a lot of IXs focus on Manila area where it is uh, dense and, and initially most of the cable stations are there. But we've seen also uh, growth in Cebu and Davao, which was a big push, especially during Cascades on the NOG, giving the community visibility and understanding how important this is. On the right side are the data centers. Uh, we've seen a tremendous growth for this one as well. Historically, only local players uh, have their own DCs. Uh, normally, it's the big players that you can call them uh, Globe and uh, PLDT, but we've seen here there are other players as well. And the latest one coming in, uh, coming from abroad, which is Digital Edge, Flow Digital, and uh, SCT. And it has expanded as well, going down south to Visayas and Mindanao. Okay. So, about traffic, as much as we want traffic to be local as possible, there's traffic going out. So historically, this is a very uh, US-centric traffic profile. But based on the current trend, 
we now have a very Asia centric. So it's mainly driven by the user profile uh, and, and the close pro proximity of Philippines to, to Asia, which actually is part of it. When you, you break that down further, we will see here Hong Kong with more traffic compared to uh, Singapore and Japan, where most of the connectivity from Philippines are. Hong Kong plays an important role because it's, it becomes the next gateway for us in terms of uh, geographical distance. But we also see some movement in traffic uh, with the current geopolitical situation in Hong Kong. So some traffic are now moving to Singapore and, and Japan. That's why the current trend is to build additional facilities in those areas for redundancy purposes. So now sharing some local trends or lessons uh, coming back to the geopolitical session about the uh, Hong Kong, we see now Philippines as positioned to be a regional hub. So most of the players in Asia have this kind of position as well, uh, but we're getting to that, uh, that setup. We see new players coming in as uh, coming from the, the cable TV, from them providing traditional service to new services, including internet. And port size, we started to adopt to 100 Gs. Uh, you can see we're kind of late, but you know we can still catch up in the game. Uh, last time I was called if 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 like we can provide hundred Gs already. I say yes because we can do ten by ten, so it's total is hundred G. But now it's not a joke, so we can do multiple hundred Gs. For policy, uh, hearing is more open currently. Uh, it's more of a learning thing. Um, similar to the next part of expansion, like connectivity, diversity. So what we actually learned here is something needs to go down, something needs to go bad before you actually do something. So it's a learning experience, but I think we're going to the next direction, a good direction in terms of adoption for that one. For geopolitics, uh, the current trend in Philippines is more of having uh, a clean pipe. So the clean pipe on how did we defined it is very much driven on having certain equipment only in your facility. So uh, for that one, it's uh, it's it's very specific to a uh, non-Chinese. Uh, sorry for that, but there were there are requirements uh, for some customers who actually define that, and it comes in an RFP. So it's either you provide that service or not. Uh, for the reason, it's it's mainly dependent on on, on their uh, request. So it's 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 a matter of the provider giving that service. If he cannot, it will just be provided to something else. For regulatory, there's a strong push on anti-child porn, which I think is good. And uh, government is having a good uh, position on that one, taking part in the 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 cleanup of internet service. For traffic trends, we also some we also saw something different. Yes, it's social media, OTT, but you know during the pandemic, it has driven people to have their own content, which actually help us localize traffic more because it's within the Philippines. And on for other lessons like increasing international collaboration, as mentioned earlier, uh, there have been there have been joint ventures, so Globe partnered with STT and UDC is coming in. That is Digital Edge and Flow. For IXP, we have Getafix uh, having an agreement with D6 uh, to bring that facility here. And there are more uh, coming in. Cable system, as mentioned, we have new nine. And then uh, Starlink just started to provide service in the Philippines last February. For community, there are other players like USA, Beacon, and Open Run, which actually helps the community network in terms of providing uh, services that are not yet available uh, or being given by the existing providers. Now, to sum, sum that up, uh, this is really a more of a focus here because you know you have a lot of initiatives, but there should be something, uh, someone or a group pushing that. So I think that one is the NOG currently, which is actually uh, currently the neutral ground for everyone here. Historically, you will not be able to see ISPs or different providers in one room unless HR comes in and they get called because they might be thought of being collaborating on something. 
But after PHNOG or during PHNOG, it became a knowledge sharing session, a venue for collaboration, and it's very much neutral ground. Everybody's more or less uh, expecting that one uh, every year. And for the final slide, I would like to give you some local words. Uh, Discarte is one of that. So it currently means something close to we'll find a way or we'll make it happen. So we normally don't say no. It's not really a yes or no answer for here. We provide different answers in saying no, but we will find a way. Uh, sometimes it can be a not so good way, but we will make it happen. The next one is uh, walang, walang katapusan. So it means uh, it never ends. So in this line of work, it's, it's an endless cycle. There's no finish line. So normally when, when we are asked, uh, so what's your next project? Oh, this is my next project. Does it end here? It doesn't end because every time we do an upgrade, every time we uh, provide uh, uh, inputs or enhance the network, you will always need something else. You will always need higher bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last one is uh, consentia. So this is like very personal to me. It's uh, really an internet of, of conscience. It's not what you do. It's what even uh, comes to what you don't do that affects everybody. Because here everything is uh, kind of wired to customer centric, but not everybody are customers. Like here, not everybody customers, but everybody are peers. So we need to help each other in making the community better. That's all. Thank you. Well, time or questions, right? Any comments and questions? I think if you ask questions, you can get free coffee outside, right? That's uh okay. So this is uh one comment from me. Go sir. Uh, uh so uh, uh, you mentioned about the new players uh from cable TV uh on the slide of the local plan. So the, uh uh I think uh in the Philippines uh, there are several uh, big players as uh, eyeballs. Uh, PIDT Globe and uh, recently Dito. So, uh, and uh, if you have the relation, uh, if you have information related to, to the uh, newcomers, uh, the uh, reason why uh, they uh, appeared uh, recently. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, please uh, share the information. If if I don't think I understand the question, can you uh, further? Yeah. So the uh, uh, new players uh, from cable TV uh, has been appeared uh, as a new player uh, as uh, of uh, eyeballs. So uh, uh, for a long time, uh, there are uh, network uh, provider group your PIDD. Uh, Dito. So, but uh, I'd like to know the reason why a uh, new player uh, from cable TV uh, has been appeared. Oh, okay. So, I can only assume a couple of answers. Uh, probably one of them is to provide service that the existing providers cannot, since we have a lot of islands. So, they might be in a specific area. And Globe is not there, PLDT is not there, Dito is not there. So they're the ones who provide the service. But they still connect to the main ISPs or telco ISPs who have the current infrastructure. And flipping that one, the big players as well will also need them because if they cannot reach part of the edge of some areas in the Philippines, they will need to tap those players uh currently those cable tvs uh since they have their own infrastructure and backbone uh probably realize that can also they can also provide internet service and they don't need to wait for the big players to come in so from that perspective uh there are all there are other uh items that they would like to also address 
maybe one of them is uh, revenue or uh, additional visibility, but at the end of the day, it's, I think, probably providing services. Thank you for sharing your information. So, uh, other comments and questions? No? Uh, yeah. So, uh, thank you for a great presentation. So, uh, let's, thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, let's give a good hand to Achi. And uh, next is uh, peering personas. So can you moderate peering personas? Yes, uh, so I will not be going down, but I will introduce another person. Uh, for the next session, this will be an IXP uh, list and our current moderator will be Alice Lava. Al? Thanks, Achi. Okay, for the next session for the peering personals, we'd like to call on the IXPs listed here uh, to fall in line here at the left side of the, on the stage. And we'll call you up uh, one by one. All right. So uh, first one up would be BBIX. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa from BBX Japan. Uh, BBX stands for Broadband Internet Exchange. We are one of the major XPs um, in Asia and also 100% subsidiary of SoftBank Club. Currently, we have a, our global presence in Tokyo, Osaka, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, uh, Bangkok, and the USA and Europe. Our current traffic is over 5.4 tela, and we have over 300 participants. Should you be interested to connect with us, please feel free to send an email to our group sales uh, email ID. Last but not least, um, this year marks our 20th anniversary, and we would love to celebrate this big day with all our customers, partners, and friends on June 30th in Tokyo. So if you are interested, please come to our booth, which is just right outside of the room. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Next up would be Bangkok Mutual Internet Exchange. Hi, everyone. I'm Padma from Bikenik. Uh, Bikenik is an internet uh, first internet exchange in Thailand. And uh, our main site is in Bangkok. Uh, right now, we have a few uh, five pop connected with the peering location, including TCC, Bangna, uh, CW Tower, M Thailand, and NTT Bangkok 2, and last one, STT Telemedia uh, Bangkok 1. Also, that uh, right now we have the peak traffic is 140. And outside, that's, uh, we have expanding in the near future that uh, we uh, expand to the northern area, Chiang Mai, and now we have, we have two pop connected with the uh, telecom side, Symphony and Chiang Mai University. Right now we have uh, four member connected, and then uh, peak traffic is the nearly two gigabit. Uh, for more information, please uh, check out at peering db and email to us at peering at bikinic Thank you. Thank you, Patama. Next is Desips. Hello, hi, very good afternoon. So my name is Marcus Tan from DKIX. I'm based in Singapore. So um, through here, we have um, 18 different sites across our distributed peering, ranging from Malaysia, um, Singapore, Brunei, and now we have the partnership with Getafix, we're in the Philippines. Um, at the um, 
our distributed fabric itself, we have 70 plus AS numbers with a peak traffic of uh, 90 plus gigs. And for more information, please check out our peer and DB. Um, feel free to reach out to me for any more new information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, it's Epix from Jakarta. Skip to next. Next up is Equinix. Hello, um, magandang hapon. I'm Alma from Equinix. Um, we are in five continents, 23 countries, and right now we have 197 Equinix IBX all across the globe. So our new hot presents are Melbourne, Perth, Osaka, and Seoul. Um, AS number is 24115. Um, traffic is balanced, and our traffic volume is around 21 terabytes. Um, yeah, so you can contact um, Angus. John, Maggie are all here from Service Provider Interconnection Team. Um, if you want to go and connect with us, um, you can find us in PeeringDB at AS24115, uh, Peering.com, uh, PeeringDB. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. Next up is Gio from Getafix. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gio from Getafix. Um, Getafix is, is, I think, now the traffic in terms of members and content is the the the, the number one uh, IX in the country. Uh, we're located in all the major data centers in the in Manila, Vitro, Makati, Juan, Two, Pasig, Paranaque, Tim Carmona, and and Globe MK2. And our direction is to locate in any major data center that will sprout in the Philippines. Uh, we have 65 ASNs and peaking at around 130 uh, gigs of traffic and growing. And we all also recently uh, put uh, get a fix in the the Visayan region of uh, of the Philippines as we push forward to attract more provincial um, ISPs. And as mentioned by um, uh, Achi, the growing cable companies serving out of reach uh, Filipinos. So we're putting that up and maybe next year we'll have another column here because we'll be located in the island of Mindanao. Um, and yeah, um, you can you can see our uh, hearing DB entries, 2345 for Manila and 3558 um, in Cebu. And, um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that kicks and I, I were buying beers later after the peering social. It's it's primarily for Getafix members, but I think we're I think we're you know we'll we'll open that up to everyone. So thank you. Thanks, you. Next up, we welcome a new face from Globe, Mr. Achi Achensa. Yes, I'm back. So we also operate an, an IX, it's called Globe Internet uh, Exchange. Current deployment is in MK2 in Makati, but we extended presence as well in Cebu and coming soon in Davao and Quezon City. So all the details are there, so you can check it out if you want to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Hachi. Next up, Hong Kong IX. Hello, everyone. I'm Kenneth from Hong Kong IX. We have two core sites in the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and we also have a new core site in the Hong Kong Cyberport. Besides that, we also have some uh, satellite sites in data center. We have HKS2 in CTEC and HKS3 and 3B in Megaite and HKIX4 in NTT and also HKIX5 in KDDI. We have more than 340 participants and we have peak traffic about 2.4 terabit. Um, we have uh, implemented uh, our PKI and also we are managed compliance. Uh, you, for you, what you want to have more information, uh, you can go to our website or you can go to PeeringDB. And uh, if you have any question, you can come over to me or you can go outside for uh, to our booth to get more information. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next is Interlan IX. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Eric from uh, Interland Internet Exchange. We are the biggest uh, internet exchange in Romania, Southeastern Europe. Uh, we have uh, one uh, network distributed uh, all over the country with uh, several pops in um, Bucharest, the capital of Romania, and uh, also uh, another several pops in uh, main, uh, the main cities of, uh, of the country. Um, we have uh, 130 ISNs connected in our internet exchange with a peak traffic of 500 gigabits uh, per second. And uh, our out server are using uh, Bird, of course. You can find us on uh, PeeringDB and also IXPDB. And um, I would like to mention that um, we concluded the partnership with DKX last year and um, our ping VLAN is uh, available on uh, DKX Global Network. Well, if you need more information, you can find me here and my colleague, Christian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up is JKT IX, Jakarta IX. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Koto Gashi from the JKT IX. JKT IX is uh, one of the biggest IX in Indonesia. Uh, this was just launched uh, five years ago, but uh, we are having a really nice rapid growth. And now we our member is a more than 300. And uh, nowadays we have a uh, 100 AS per year. So we are actually forecasting the 400 AS member in this year. And um, we our pop is a uh, mainly now located in uh, Jakarta only. That is a capital city of the Indonesia. But this year, 2023, we are planning to build a new pop in uh, each regional area so that the JKD IS can cover the national traffic. And uh, for more information, please search JKD IX on the pairing DB and uh, please contact us. That is really welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ko. Next up is JPIX. JPIX. Skip to the next one. Next up is. Okay, JPIX. <laughs> uh, sorry, so sorry for being late. <laughs> yeah, uh, I come back again. So the uh, JPX as uh, JPX uh, is running three networks. Uh, one is Tokyo, uh, two is uh, second is Osaka, and third is Fukuoka. So the, uh, uh, as we uh, see uh, this slide, so the, uh, we are uh, uh, Pops data center uh, in Tokyo and. Uh, Osaka, so new data center is uh, uh, MCT Cellularity uh, NRT10 Tokyo uh, and the MCT Cellularity Osaka Kix11 in Osaka. So the, uh, if you're interested in the connecting to the JPIX, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, JP Nap. Hello, everyone. And my name is Takao Chiyama, an uh, peering coordinator of the JPNAP. And uh, JPNAP is uh, one of the largest internet exchange in, in Asia Pacific region. And our uh, peak traffic is 5.4 terabps. And so uh, uh, we have pop in Tokyo and Osaka and Fukuoka and Sendai. Uh, we want to connect to uh, a more inter international international customer like you, and uh, if you have any question of JPNAP, uh, feel free to contact us, uh, Toyama, Uchiyama, uh, Kevin, Kiyuki, and Hide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, let's call on Jambu IX from IPTP. Yes, uh, hello again. Uh, it's uh, our deep in in. Uh, uh, internet exchange services. Uh, we just launched two years ago the new internet exchange in uh, Lima, Peru, and it uh, appears uh, successful uh, at the moment is according to the peer in DB23 members, but we are actually, in fact, it's uh, 30 members already connected uh, and it's keep growing, not all using peer in DB in uh, Latin America, but and we can see that it's a successful uh, start for us. And another location we started uh, recently in uh, Cyprus, 
also uh, based on our network and, and our data center. So uh, if anyone interested in Latin America or this uh, small unique island in the uh, Mediterranean, please uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Next up, Gloria D from Creative Exchange. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Gloria from Kinks, K I N X. Um, we are the representing IX platform in based in Seoul, South Korea. Um, the point of presence that we have, so you can connect to our IX platform through our Kings Dogo, Gasan, Bundang, or Sangam uh, centers, but we also have remote peering available in um, from Japan to, at Tokyo CC1 and uh, Mega Plus Hong Kong. So uh, right now we have about 86 uh, ASNs connected to our platform, which changes from over uh, from time to time. Peak traffic of 522 gigabits per second. And yes, we do have a route server. Um, if yeah, feel free to reach out to our global biz, uh, which takes care of the peering. And um, yes, uh, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Gloria. Next up would be links. Hi, everyone. My name is Halil. I'm from Lynx, the London Internet Exchange. Uh, we're a little way away from here, um, but happy to be here nonetheless. Um, so we've got uh, a few sites. Uh, many, are obviously, are in the UK, um, so I won't go over those, but the regional exchanges. Obviously, London's our predominant exchange with over 16 data centers. Uh, then we have Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, uh, which is in partnership with SDC. Um, so if anyone is interested in peering in, in Saudi, please let us know. And then we have our latest venture, which is uh, Lynx Nairobi in Kenya, which will be launching hopefully by the summer. Uh, for London, we have over 900 plus ASs connected, and you can see the traffic stats there, but uh, there's about 54 terabits of traffic flowing across the exchange at any given point. Um, so it's quite a large exchange. Uh, we do have root servers on all of our exchange platforms. Uh, in London, you're able to access about a third of the routing table from accessing the root server. So I'd recommend everyone does use the root server to the best of their abilities. Um, and the same for Jeddah, and it will be for Nairobi as well. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, even if it's not about peering in London, but just peering in general. Uh, we're always happy to assist on any level possible from a technical perspective, commercial, et cetera. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up is Mariana Islands IX. Off day, everybody. Jose Santiago from University of Guam. Uh, the university, we operate a open uh, carrier neutral IX called Marix. So it's the first carrier neutral IX on the island. Um, currently we have 10 members, but that's outdated. Just five days ago, we got a new member. So that's actually 11. Uh, we're peaking traffic about four gigabits. So it is a small island, 13 small islands, four local ISPs. Um, we, our route servers, we do FRR and BIRD for redundancy, research, testing, and just diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Osai. Next up, Myanmar Internet Exchange. Hello. My name is Damien Khan. I'm, uh, I'm running Myanmar Internet Exchange. So the, at the time being, we have only one Bob in Yango, but our traffic is growing very fast. Now the peak traffic is 110 gigabit per second. We'll set up another Bob in Mandalay. We hope uh, it will be up and running this April. What we need is uh, more content. Now, more, uh, Myanmar internet traffic is really growing fast, but uh, our content, most of the content are going to the outside. So I like to request if you are a content provider, please try to try MMIX and especially locating our local in, in Myanmar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Next up is uh, my IX. 
IIX. Okay. And we skip one. Next up is Inter Exchange of Nepal. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Rupesh Rasta. Uh, I'm from Internet Exchange Nepal, call sign NPIX. Uh, we have three pops. One is uh, Kathmandu, city of Kathmandu, called NPIX PTS. Another one is in Patan, called uh, NPIX JWS. Another new one is coming up in uh, Data Hub. Data Hub. Uh, rest of the details, I think it's already there. Uh, if you contact, want to contact me, rupes at npx.net.np. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rupesh. Next one is from NZIX. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave from the New Zealand Internet Exchange. We're a um, non-profit member-run IX in New Zealand. Uh, we offer we operate uh, Auckland IX, which is the biggest IX in New Zealand. Um, there we've got about 90 ASNs, I believe. Um, we're peaking to about 450 gig on our sort of biggest peak. Uh, we're in five different pops around um, Auckland. We've got most of our relevant um, ISPs in the country already on board. Um, so if you're an international considering coming to New Zealand, then please get in contact. We'd love to have you on board. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Next one is PCTA IX. Hi, good afternoon. I am Michael Pablo de la Paz from PCTA IX. You can call me Pabs. Um, PCTA is the association of cable TV operators, and internet service providers in the Philippines. So we are located in TIM Carmona. Um, our peak traffic is 11 gig, and we have route server. And the peering DB is peeringdb.com slash 3379. So you can contact me if you want to connect with us. Thank you. Thanks, Pabs. Next one would be RIX. Thank you. Hi, uh, Takanuri again. Uh, I'd like to introduce RyuQIX, we call Rix. Uh, RyuQIX is a, a local Japan, uh, local Japan internet exchange in Okinawa Island. Only Okinawa Island uh, taking a service for that. And uh, it's still small because Okinawa Island is very small. And But the traffic is 20 right now and uh, S is eight. Okina has only 12 A's uh, landing for this area. So eight is, is already enough. But uh, we are waiting for the remote peering from Tokyo or maybe Osaka. But please contact us. Uh, we are very available to uh, happy peering. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Dr. Narison. Next up, SGIX. Hi, afternoon. Uh, I'm Danny from SGIS. Uh, we are AS55518. Uh, currently, we have more than 191 ASN. Peak traffic is about 1.8 terabytes. Uh, we have two route servers. So any inquiry or you need any more information, you can contact us at info at sgis.sg. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Next up is Sunny Vision I Advantage. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew, a uh, consultant from Sunny Vision I Advantage, a uh, data center provider. Um, our index range IAIX, the AS number is 9729. And it's available on our mega campus, including Mega I, Mega Plus, Mega Two, and also the new data center, Mega Gateway, and Mega IDC. And besides IAIX, we also are uh, collaborating with HKIX to operate HKIX satellite site uh, on our Mega campus. Um, and the last, um, we are excited to enhance our uh, ADC. Uh, landed Hong Kong segment in our Sunny Vision cable landing station. And we are working on second one. Uh, feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Next up is Thailand IX. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. I'm B from Thailand IX. Uh, our IX location are in Bangkok and Nontaburi. Yeah, uh, we have 59 members connected to us, and the topic is uh, more than 300 gigs. Uh, you can find more information at our website, th.ix.net, or on PairingDB, and you can console, uh, also contact us, our team, Surasit, Bell, or B. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is TPIX. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's Jeff Hong again. Uh, I represent for TPIX, and TPIX is the short name for Taipei Internet Exchange, and uh, TPIX is the biggest ISP in Taiwan. TPIX is operated by Chief Telecom. That's why I'm here, and members can join and connect at Chiefs main data centers such as Chief LY and Chief HD. We also can provide overseas connection such as from Hong Kong, Equinix Hong Kong One Mega I for the connection to TBIS in Taiwan. TBIS currently have 130 members and uh, for the numbers of members, we are the 109 largest IX globally. And we are very aggressively to expand the numbers of our members and welcome to TBIX. The peak traffic of TBIX is 226 G and we have route servers, net floor, and RPKI security mechanism for our internet change. And finally, welcome to Taiwan and join TBIX for better connectivity in Taiwan. Thanks. Thank you, TBIX. Next one, we have Vitro, BIX. Good afternoon, uh, I'm JA for Vitro Internet Exchange or VIX. So our location is here in the Philippines. Uh, point of presence, we have in Vitro Makati 2, Vitro Pasig, and in Vitro Paranaque. For the connected ASNs, we have uh, around 80, uh, in which uh, 67 of those are unique ASNs. For the peak traffic, we have around 500 Gbps. And for the route servers, uh, in all three sites, we have our route servers, uh, all our Cisco ASRs, 9900 series. Then, uh, for the peering DB, uh, it's here. Then, uh, unfortunately, it's not yet updated, but we're already working on it. If you have any queries or questions, uh, you may email me, or I'll be just around here during the conference. Uh, you may directly reach to me. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Epix. Ralph. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Raphael. I'm from uh, Digital Edge, and I want to take this opportunity to announce our uh, latest internet exchange uh, in Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, so the name is Epix, Edge Peering Interconnection Exchange, uh, and we are at uh, those locations in Jakarta. Uh, so we can reach cyber entity via campus fiber as well. Uh, as I said, it's a brand new exchange, so we only have three customers running about 300 megs right now, but uh, uh, we, we've actually got a pretty good pipeline of 100 gig ports with our customers. And uh, thank you for the Indonesian uh, internet community for supporting us. Uh, so hopefully that number should go up significantly uh, soon. Uh, we're running uh, two bird route servers and uh, running our PKI. Uh, and i just like like to announce that our Epic Asia event is going to be held in Jakarta at the uh, 29th of August, so uh, please check out the website, www.epicasia.com, and uh, you know, let us know your interest. So uh, we're also thinking about uh, opening an internet exchange in, in, in uh, Manila, so if there's any interest, please uh, uh, come and say hi to me as well. Thank you. Thank you, Raf. And thank you as well to all the presenters. That's it for the forum too, right? And if you are interested to peer with any one of those presenters, you can look for them around the conference halls. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Al. Uh, just one quick announcement before I turn over the mic to Mr. Takasan. Uh, by PH no tradition, we normally do a raffle or a lucky draw. So we have uh, a local sponsor who will be raffling, raffling, raffling off uh, something. So we request you to drop your business cards or if you don't have a piece of paper. So we're we'll going to pick that up at the end of the session later. Uh, Larry, can you raise that ball? Uh, so that's the ball. Uh, drop your cards there. Only one card per person, uh, just to make sure everything is even. Uh, thank you. Uh, giving back the mic to Masataka-san to close the session. Yeah, so that's all of the peering forum number two. So uh, peering uh, forum number three, uh, we'll start from 4.30 p.m. Uh, uh, you can have a uh, coffee or a tea uh, outside. Uh, so uh, please have good coffee time. Thank you.